I was reading just this morning that I think the the latest number of homes that the Israeli military has destroyed in Gaza, it's, it's like two out of three homes in the whole Gaza Strip. You know, more than two million people live there. That's, you know, two thirds of them don't have a home to go back to. And even if they they do have a home, they certainly don't have a school, they don't have a hospital, this, you know, this place, uh, of, worship. The place of worship, they don't have anywhere to go to work. Um, a lot of the agricultural fields have been targeted. Miranda Cleland, uh, welcome to Fort Wayne and welcome to Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Thanks, Michael. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, advocacy officer for Defense for Children International Palestine. You uh, lead or help to lead actually now the No Way to Treat a Child campaign and um, many of the other initiatives of Defense for Children International Palestine. So we'll get to some of them. But let me start with this. I cannot stress enough how necessary it is for all of us to wake up every morning and believe and insist that we can and must live in a world where children aren't drone striked at a playground. Israel is counting on your fatigue and hopelessness. Who wrote that? I wrote that on Twitter uh, the day before I got here, I suppose. Um, yeah, I mean, that was the, the latest news bit out of Gaza that um, 11 children were killed in an Israeli drone strike on a playground in a refugee camp in Gaza. And it, I don't know, it seems like just one, one thing on an extremely long list of atrocities that have been carried out by the Israeli military since October in particular, but also in the last 75 years. And so I, you know, doing, doing this work, I've really been trying to remind myself that even if there are moments or days where I and others need to take a step back take a moment to breathe, take a break. We cannot give up. We really do have to make a choice every morning when we get up to believe in a world where children can grow up and lead the lives that they, they are entitled entitled to, to lead. Um, and it's hard. And I, I think that's the choice that we have to make every day. And we have to continue believing it in order for it to become true. After a while, the, the reason that this spoke so powerfully to me is after a while, even words like ethnic cleansing or genocide are, well, it's been going on for, they, those terms all of a sudden become like background noise or, or, or they normalize. And so, yeah, we just sort of continue on with our day. Mm -hmm. But this sort, of, this sort of attack and murder of innocent children playing on the playground, that should reverberate within our hearts mm -hmm. in horror yeah. and yet it becomes we go on and the world goes on and the beat goes on and we send more weapons and yeah. all the rest. So it really, I, I appreciated this because it, it grabbed my heart once mm. again and reminded me again of the importance of your work, our work. Yeah, thank you. 20,000 orphaned children or more and how many amputees. Mm -hmm. And so this, the focus, the thing that I appreciate most about Defense for Children International Palestine is its laser focus on children and young people. Because we can get lost in how overwhelming mm -hmm. all the rest, the whole issue is. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about uh, that focus of yours. And yeah. the organization. Sure, yeah. So Defense for Children International Palestine was founded in 1991, and it remains the only human rights organization in Palestine focused exclusively on the rights of children. Um, so we look to international law as the, the basis, the thing that really roots our work and the, the framework that we look to to promote children's rights, defend children's rights, and push for accountability for actors that violate children's rights, namely the Israeli government and the Israeli military. Um, we provide legal aid to children who have been detained by the Israeli military. Uh, we document 
and expose human rights violations against children, um, such as when children are um, killed, injured, detained, tortured by the Israeli military. We collect evidence um, of their experience and then we advocate on the, the national and the international levels um, for greater protections for them and for accountability um, for the Israeli military and the actions that they've taken against Palestinian children. The, uh, um, today is day 195 of Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza in particular. Um, yesterday was Palestinian Prisoners Day. Mm -hmm. uh, since when, 19, uh, I have it in my notes here, what, uh, 1974, mm -hmm. I believe it was. So talk to us about the impact of the military court system on f children, on their families in mm -hmm. particular, just that whole, mm -hmm. th that whole system yeah. in which children are particularly caught up. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't mind, when we were just there in February, we always meet with uh, Gerard Horton and mm -hmm. Sawa Duebas from Military Court Watch. Mm -hmm. And their documentation of children in prisons is that, is it 80% did he say or more of the children, child imprisonments um, come from violations within 100 yards of settlement or mm -hmm. within a mile of a something like that. Mm -hmm. So these illegal settlements are part of the problem because they're encroaching into Palestinian territory. Mm -hmm. Children rebel, youth rebel, yeah. and then they're thrown into prison. So yeah. please. Yeah, so I mean, we've, we've definitely seen that children who grow up in areas close to sometimes we call it occupation infrastructure. So an Israeli military checkpoint or military base or the the wall that separates the occupied west bank from israel um anything sort of in that category so occupation infrastructure or illegal israeli settlements in the west bank children who grow up close to to anything sort of in one of those categories are disproportionately um exposed to israeli violence and have more interactions with soldiers and settlers um, and so part of our, our work with the military courts is um, providing legal aid to children who have been detained and also documenting the experience um, of children that, that sort of go through this system. Um, every year the Israeli military detains between 500 and 700 Palestinian children um, in the occupied West Bank. And about 60% of those children are detained from their homes in the middle of the night. So that looks like soldiers showing up to someone's home at two or three, four, five in the morning. Um, they burst through the door, wake everybody up, um, and they'll go and take that child out of their room. The children are almost all boys, and they're between the ages of, of 12 and 17. Um, under international law, a child is anybody under the age of 18, and under Israeli military law, the age of criminal responsibility is 12. So the vast majority of, when, when we're talking about children in the military courts, we're talking about almost all boys, a few girls, but mostly boys between the ages of 12 and 17, and the most of those children are on the, the older end of that spectrum between their 16 or 17 year olds. Um, so one, once the child is, sort of in Israeli military custody, at that moment, about three quarters of them experience some form of physical violence from Israeli soldiers. They are kicked, beaten, um, sometimes struck with the soldier's helmet or the butt of his gun. Uh, and then they're taken into the back of an Israeli military vehicle off to an interrogation center. And at that moment, the parents don't know where their child's being taken, what they're being accused of or what they're being charged with, or when they'll see them again. Um, many times the child is taken to an Israeli interrogation center that's located inside an Israeli settlement where Palestinians are not allowed to go, or they're taken out of the occupied West Bank into Israel itself, which is a violation of the Geneva Conventions, and that, that's sure. a war crime known as forcible transfer. Um, 
So once they arrive to an interrogation center, about 80% of children are strip searched by an adult Israeli soldier. Um, and once they are in an interrogation, almost all of them are denied the ability to have a parent or family member with them during the interrogation. Um, majority of interviews are not audiovisually recorded and they're denied access to a lawyer before they complete that interrogation. And the interrogations are carried out by adult Israeli interrogators, typically who speak very good Arabic um, and are trying to extract a confession from the child for whatever he may be accused of. Um, things like throwing stones, disrespecting a soldier's honor, um, being a part of a, a band group. Um, the soldier puts a lot of energy into extracting this confession and really using any means necessary in order to coerce that confession. Um, we found that during the interrogation process, about one in four children are placed into solitary confinement for the purpose of extracting a confession. And we've seen that once a child goes into solitary confinement, the average amount of time that they'll spend there is about 16 days. And we've documented cases where children have spent up to up, upwards of, of 30 days in solitary confinement, which really has a tremendous psychological impact um, on a, a child who's still developing. Um, the majority of the work that our lawyers do providing def uh, legal aid to these children is focusing on getting plea deals, as that is the quickest guaranteed way to get out of the military court system. Um, if a case were to go to trial, the it would all be carried out in a military court in Hebrew. So the judge is a soldier, the prosecutor is a soldier, everybody that the child is interacting with is a soldier, except for their defense lawyer. Um, and the conviction rate in these courts is upwards of 95%, which is a number I think that really tells you all you need to know about uh, the legitimacy of this court and the, the arbitrary nature of how um, the Israeli military uses this military court system um, to target children and their families. Talk a little bit about um, the threat or the blackmail of these children to squeal on a, a, a neighbor kid who is or a friend who threw a stone too, or to even turn them to be, uh, uh, you know, to, to maybe uh, uh, confess about others in their, or mm -hmm. become a collaborator in some ways, yeah. you know, uh, uh, kind of undercover in, because of threats to their families and things like mm -hmm. that, unimpressionable kids. Yeah. I mean, no, that's, those are realities yeah, too. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's a pretty common interrogation technique that will get you um, off a little earlier yeah, a little lighter or... yeah yeah um you know they're they're looking for children to really give any kind of information on their friends their teachers their brothers their parents their uncles um and uh, i i think it goes without saying that any information shared under coercion shared under torture is is not credible information and is um, I think that is a particularly heinous and manipulative technique when used against uh, children who are totally terrified that they'll never see their parents again. One of the things I've been saying when I've been giving talks <clears throat> is that this isn't just a war on Gaza or even, even a war on Palestinian people. It's a war on the very idea of Palestine itself, mm. its culture, its heritage, its memory, its future. One of the headlines in Palestine Deep Dive in the last few days. Israel bombed Gaza's largest fertility clinic, mm. destroying 4,000 embryos with one shell. And it's a war on the fu very mm -hmm. future, the very idea of Palestine mm -hmm. itself. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, that is a very, it, it's, a, it's a hallmark of genocide, right? Is to not only kill people in huge numbers um, and to destroy their their homes and schools and communities and um, places of worship. It's 
that is genocide, but genocide is also creating or targeting the conditions that create life and um, targeting children yet to be born. We see this as um, the Israeli military continues to target um, pregnant women and mothers. And I, I, I did think of that when I saw the news about the fertility clinic. And um, I've been thinking too about, you know, we now are in a situation where northern Gaza especially is facing famine. Um, Say more about that, using yeah. food as a weapon. That's one of my questions yeah. here. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Israeli military and Israeli authorities have deliberately and systematically blocked and severely restricted the amount of humanitarian aid um, that's entering Gaza, but especially in the north. Um, and there have been, I think, 28 reported cases of children who have died of starvation, We're malnutrition and dehydration. And um, going back to how genocide targets the conditions that create life and the ability to create future life, most of the children who have died of malnutrition have been newborn babies, which means that their mothers, while they were pregnant, were malnourished for months before they gave birth. Um, and, you know, these were newborn babies who were born starving. And that, I mean, that is genocide. That is an act of war that's using starvation and food as a weapon, a weapon of war. As long as we're talking about food as a weapon and humanitarian aid, um, we can't, we just can't get around the fact that our government's complicit and even criminal uh, mm -hmm. in this. Uh, um, Congress, uh, the Biden administration. Uh, so say a word about just, I know that you work with Defense for Children International Palestine, so you're, this, this is not a, you're not beholden to U.S. political interests. You, you have a global concern, but you're based in, in Washington, D.C., and mm -hmm. you're in tune with what's happening in this country, particularly in its complicity mm -hmm. with uh, uh, the Israeli genocide. So talk about the U.S. government uh, complicity, uh, any, um, talk about the court case maybe, mm -hmm. and uh, anything else you'd like to share. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's no secret that the U.S. sends almost $4 billion a year to um, fund the Israeli military. That makes up about 20% of the, the Israeli military's annual budget. Um, and almost no reporting is required by the United States on how those funds are spent, what they're used for. Um, things, and that's been things increased along. too since October 7th. Yes, yes, I'm yes, sorry. yes, yes. So um, the U.S. has sent more funds. They've authorized more weapon sales during these expedited processes. And in several cases, the president has actually bypassed congressional review and the congressional process. Um, which is designed to, in theory, have a little more oversight into these types of transactions. Um, as Defense for Children International Palestine, we filed a lawsuit um, against the Biden administration targeting President Biden, Secretary of State Blinken, and Secretary of State Austin. We filed this back in November for the failure to prevent genocide of Palestinians in Gaza through their complicity and um, ironclad, as they like to say, ironclad support of the Israeli government and the military by continuing to provide um, weapons, funding, and diplomatic support and coverage um, to, to the military campaign. Um, we first asked the, the federal judge for an emergency order to instruct the Biden administration to stop providing all of this support um, while the court considers the case. Um, and while the judge did end up dismissing the case, which we're going to appeal, um, in his, his ruling and in his sort of final word on it, he, the judge noted that Israel does plausibly seem to be carrying out genocide, and he strongly urged the executive branch to reconsider their support for Israel. Um, I think the... 
both the domestic and the international legal system will not be they will not be the things that save us that 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 save Palestinians but I think these are sort of tools in our toolbox that um, it's really important to um, to use them to the fullest extent and say that you know if if these systems exist in theory to hold people accountable to have some oversight on the executive branch and what how the president is sending off weapons and money um, to the Israeli military and government then Israel should be held to the same standard that in theory other countries and other people are held to account under these under these systems and so um, I think it is sort of highlighted the the exceptionality of Israel and the way it's treated in the United States that um, you know per the president per the government Israel can do no wrong in the United States will continue sending so many of our tax dollars so many of our weapons um, as Israel carries out uh, genocide against Palestinians provide cover at the UN mm -hmm. right provide diplomatic cover um, use the US veto at the UN um, to to protect Israel so I th yeah I think um, Biden at least has shown that he'll do whatever they want um, in order um, to avoid getting the Israeli government in any sort of meaningful trouble. Talk a little bit about um, the use of food as a weapon. We've, we've talked about the military mm -hmm. court system. Gaza's hospitals, mm -hmm. none of them, what, what, 36 hospitals or medical centers, none of them have not been either destroyed to the ground, rubble, are significantly, significantly mm -hmm. uh, damaged. Mm -hmm. uh, say a little bit about uh, that. Yeah, uh, I mean, the Israeli military campaign on Gaza has totally collapsed Gaza's health system. And I, I say that because sometimes we say, oh, the health system has collapsed. Well, it didn't just fall apart yeah, it's, on it, its own. Not in the is, passive voice. It, right? is, oh, yeah, <laughs> it, is on, it is on purpose that the health system has has fallen apart and crumbled. and. Israel has Israeli military has killed so many doctors and healthcare workers and ambulance drivers and destroyed ambulances and you know there are really countless examples from the last six months that have um, it, it's difficult to keep up with the, the pace the pace of it and um, I'm thinking of, of one example from a, a, a Palestinian girl whose, whose story we, we documented with DCIP. Her name was Dunya, and she was she was from northern Gaza, and she was displaced with her family um, pretty early on in Israel's military campaign. She's 12 years old, and so that they moved somewhere else with her family, and then the place that her family was staying in was bombed by the Israeli military, killed almost her whole family. She lost her leg. Her leg had to be amputated because of the, the injuries that she suffered. And she was recovering at Nasser Hospital, which is in southern Gaza. And so she had been displaced. She had been bombed. She had lost her family. Her leg had to be amputated. And so she was in a hospital. She's 12 years old. She's, you know, recovering from all of these things that have just happened in the last month for her. And... Then, an Israeli tank shell struck Nasser Hospital, struck her right in her bed while she was sleeping. Um, and I go back to her story so often because we had filmed a video with her just a few weeks before, not, not even a couple weeks maybe before um, she was killed and we had you know, did done the editing and we were getting ready to publish it and we saw the news that that a girl had been killed in Nasser Hospital by this one tank shell that sort of went through the wall. It didn't explode, it just hit her while she was in her bed, sleeping. And, um, you know, so we have the, this video of her just a couple weeks before where she's saying, you know, I wanna grow up and I wanna be a doctor and I wanna receive 
medical treatment and I want to be able to run around like any other kid. And I find myself going back to her story so often because it really feels like a distillation of the Palestinian child's experience of all of these things happening in such a short amount of time until she was finally killed. Um, but I mean, that was an instance of one tank shell striking the hospital. It didn't explode. Um, I don't think there were any other serious injuries or fatalities as a result of that, that one tank shelling. But in the time since, you know, Israeli forces have laid a total siege to a number of hospitals throughout Gaza. Most recently, Shifa Hospital, the, the largest and main hospital in Gaza City, um, where, you know, the building is totally unrecognizable. Um, they're finding mass graves in the courtyards. Um, patients and doctors and nurses were targeted by snipers in the hallways. Um, and this is, you know, not even to say anything about the lack of electricity or medicines or um, anesthesia or, you know, any anything that you need to run a hospital, you know. Never mind all of that. You know, then you then you have soldiers, you know, sort of roaming the hallway, sniping people in the hallway. And it's, you know. It causes yeah. me to pause. And yeah. almost, I mean, I'm sitting here. I know we have to do this interview, but I'm sitting here almost in silence, just let, letting it wash over me that these yeah. things happen. Yeah. You'll, you'll talk about Dunya tonight. I mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The child's eye view of Gaza. Yeah. You mentioned displacement. That's one of the reasons why DCIP talks of, uh, documents home demolitions, mm -hmm. as well as all these other things we've been talking about. The impact of, the impact of. I mean, it's more than just a, a, a structure that gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. Your house. It really is a sense of security, a sense of home, a sense mm -hmm. of. Your parents being able to protect you, yeah. uh, uh, a loss of childhood. I mean, all these. There's all this emotional, right. visceral connectivity to mm -hmm. what home yeah. should be, right? Yeah, and I was reading just this morning that I think the the latest number of homes that the Israeli military has destroyed in Gaza. It's it's like two out of three homes in the whole Gaza Strip, you know, more than 2 million people live there. That's, you know, two thirds of them don't have a home to go back to. And even if they, they do have a home, they certainly don't have a school. They don't have a hospital. This, you know, this place, a, of, worship. The place of worship, they don't have anywhere to go to work. Um, a lot of the agricultural fields have been targeted. Um, the place sources of water have been targeted playground that we mentioned at the beginning um, you know all of these places are supposed to be safe for children and their families um, you know especially a home a home is supposed to be your safest place in the whole world is at home with your parents and you know it is it is hard I think to understand the impact of a child realizing the moment when their parents can no longer keep them safe um, that that is something that I think universally is understood as a hallmark of childhood, is believing and understanding that you are, you are the safest with your parents. Um, but that is, that is not the case for Palestinian children. I think many Palestinian children realize very young that their parents cannot keep them safe from the Israeli military. Christiane Amanpour had, <coughs> had a conversation with John Stewart. Mm -hmm. Our major problem covering Israel Gaza right now, she said, is that we can't get there. Talk to us about the media coverage of of the Israeli military, Western media, and also talk to us about you your interaction with uh, the media as mm -hmm. representative of DCIP. Yeah, I don't watch too much of what Christiane Amanpour. I says, understand. but I, I, yeah, I remember we're seeing that interview and seeing her talk about that, and I thought the use of we was so interesting because she's identifying herself as a Western journalist. Western journalists cannot get into Gaza unless they're under the cover 
or I, protection of, I was the, hoping that you would... of the Israeli military. And the if she's saying we cannot get there, she's identifying herself as a Western journalist. She's not identifying herself just as a journalist. Absolutely. And there are plenty of journalists in Palestine. As a there matter are, of fact, they're being targeted by the Israeli. Say, there, are, there are far fewer today than there were um, this time a year ago. But Palestinian journalists for a very, very long time, and especially since October 7th, have been really fearlessly, and I, I almost didn't say that word because I know they are filled with fear and that they and their families are being targeted, but their, their dedication to sharing what's going on with the outside world, and I would hope that Christiane Amanpour knows that and hopefully pays attention to what they're doing and, and takes some credence to, to their reporting and not just relying on, well, if CNN can't get in there, then we have no idea what's going on. It's like, no, we know what's going on. She passes herself off, off as kind of sympathetic, but really, I mean, there is yeah. there is still a sense of propaganda, yeah. especially through CNN. Um, I'm sorry, please. Yeah, no, please. Um, yeah, and I, I, I mean, there are so many Palestinian journalists, especially young, many of them, I think, in their 20s, who have been posting on Instagram, they've been posting on Twitter and TikTok. A lot of them just like a you know, sort of a daily report on here's how my day was today and here's what happened, here's what I saw. Um, and I I mean, I have to imagine for people like Christiane Amanpour who have been involved in sort of like network media for a very long time, I have to think that sort of scares the mainstream media a little bit because these are not people who, like, you know, Palestinian journalists, especially people who are just sharing what they're seeing from their phone or, you know, like on Instagram or TikTok or, or elsewhere on the internet, you know, they don't have to go through a major network in order to share what they're seeing. And so the network and the people who own the network don't have an opportunity to sort of weigh in and, you know, create the version of that that they want Americans to see. I think, you know, a lot of people are, um, you know, you can go on Instagram and see what's happening in Gaza for yourself. And you don't need, you don't need CNN to tell you that. Um, you don't need a white Western journalist to roam around Gaza. Someone Absolutely. who doesn't speak Arabic or know anything about the land or, or anything. So I, I have so much admiration for all the Palestinian journalists who have been really, really risking their lives um, every time they pick up the phone um, the last six months especially, um, especially as so many of them and their families have been targeted by Israeli strikes. Well, you used the word before, and of course, of course, they, they experience anxieties, fears, but these, especially younger folks, have really been fearless mm -hmm. in their reporting and in their posting, like you say, on Instagram or TikTok or, or, or the rest. And that's how, I think that's what has so well served this mass movement mm -hmm. in the West, especially among young people who are, who are getting their news not from the corporate-owned media, mm -hmm. but from their peers yeah. in, in Gaza and throughout the West Bank. Yeah. And that segues for me, uh, really, uh, I'd like for you to address, our eyes are rightly turned to Gaza. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, we, we, we need to be paying attention. Mm -hmm. But it's masking another important story, mm -hmm. and that is the ethnic cleansing and genocide that's been ramped up mm -hmm. in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so talk a little bit about the West Bank too, please. Sure, so... Your offices yeah. are in Ramallah, so yes. that in the West Bank. Yes, we are, DCIP is headquartered in Ramallah, and we have few <coughs> offices in Nablus and Hebron, so the northern and southern parts of the West Bank. Um, we part of what we do is document Palestinian child fatalities, and since October seventh alone, there have been about 115 Palestinian children who have been killed by Israeli forces just in the occupied West Bank. Um, and that is, I mean, it comes out to like almost every other day 
you know, we're documenting a kid. The majority of these children are shot with live ammunition by an Israeli soldier in the head or the chest. Um, a decent number of them are shot in the back, indicating that they were turned away from the soldier that fired the shot that killed them. Um, two of them have been American citizens, Palestinian American boys. And there's been at least one child since October 7th who was fired upon by Israeli soldiers and Israeli settlers at the same time. And we were unable to determine which is the bullet that killed him, which um, since I've been with DCIP, there have been a, a couple other cases where it was the same same story. There was a situation where um, a group of Israeli settlers sort of came into a Palestinian town or village and sort of started attacking the people who live there, um, setting cars on fire, setting homes on fire, breaking windows, robbing the stores, um, firing live ammunition at groups of Palestinians, including children. Um, and oftentimes they are accompanied by the Israeli military. Um, and if they're not accompanied by them on their way in, the military will eventually show up and provide total cover for yeah. the settlers, um, even firing alongside them. So um, in many cases, it's a, a difference without a distinction. Uh, you know, the settlers enable the soldiers and the soldiers enable the settlers. Um, many of the settlers have um, spent time in the Israeli military, and so they have military training, and many of them receive arms from the from the Israeli government. So, um, yeah, we've had, and I think especially just in the last week or so, there have been many groups of settlers sort of going into Palestinian villages, um, and and carrying out attacks. My last question is really a request and a question. Give us your pitch for uh, DCIP and uh, um, the website and just all of that. And also just uh, if there's anything else that we didn't cover mm -hmm. or that you'd like to say to those who'll be watching this interview. Yeah. One thing that really drew me to DCIP when I sort of first met the team and people who worked at the organization and what has really kept me very engaged since I've been there is the approach to the theory of change. So DCIP is a children's rights organization, so we document and expose violations against children's rights. And on the accountability side, pushing for accountability and pushing for more protections for children, we do that both inside the system and outside the system. And I have seen a lot of organizations that will kind of do one or the other, and it is hard to do both. Inside the system, our lawyers do provide legal aid to children on the individual level to get them out of the system as quickly as possible. And so that's you know working, working within the system on the day-to-day -day realities of children in the West Bank. Outside of that system, we're working with the UN, we're working with US Congress, we're working with um, activist groups, we're working um, with networks of people, faith-based communities in the US, in the UK, and several different parts of Europe. Um, in Ireland, there, there you know, there's really huge networks of, of people who are working on issues um, relating to Palestinian children. And so we, we provide a lot of support and, and guidance and advice um, and strategy support to groups that are, that are doing this work in all, all kinds of different places all over the world. And so, um, that's kind of how I see our work tackling this, this, this problem of ch violating children's rights from outside the system itself, because, um, at the end of the day, I, th I think it takes all, all, all pieces. We need to be working, working from every angle, um, to try to do everything that we can, um, to, to give Palestinian children the kind of world that they deserve to grow up in. Miranda Clellan, welcome to Fort Wayne, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, and thank you. Thanks, Michael.